but there's Pasky hard at work keeping us properly reefed. So we're going to try and get up to Norwegian Bay, so we've got to, somewhere to explore if we get shut down by the wind and make that a little bit more close to Exmouth, because we're going to pull in there before we go further north. And there goes a the fish. <laughs> we'll see how the pasky handles it. G'day everyone. This week we're continuing our cruise up the Dawea coast, but we're doing an episode with that's slightly different to normal. It is a little bit different. Yeah. People have consistently asked for ages, um, and we haven't ignored them, we just haven't got around to it. Yeah. Just to talk a little bit about um, trolling under sail, because in this episode we hadn't, we we're running pretty long provisions, but it doesn't really matter. We, we sort of don't buy a lot from the shops in terms of meat, do we? That's right, yeah. We, we rely heavily on um, what we can get from the ocean for our meat. So. Yeah, a lot of it's spearfish, but a lot of it is when we're sailing, when we're under sail and going places. Um, if you've watched a few of our episodes now, you'll know that we, we generally troll while we sail and we very rarely stop. Um, when we actually catch a fish. So we're going to have a, a little bit of a look at that in this episode. In the last episode we caught a long tail tuna at Cape Cuvier. It was beautiful, really beautiful fish. The following few days um, we were, we really were quite empty in the fridge after that long tail tuna so we were trolling every day just to catch a fish and we were eating fish every meal and yeah we had a really great time fishing up um, that part of the coast. Normally we just fish with a hard bodied lure and I know there's a really wide selection of lures out there that you can choose. What we never really put out is large pusher style lures with a big skirt on them, mm -hmm. do we? Some people might wonder why that is. <laughs> um, it's because we're not really chasing, we're not game fishing and we're not chasing any big billfish. <laughs> it's, a, it's a hell of a fight that you can pick to get a marlin on a 30 yeah. footer. <laughs> Especially underway. We have accidentally caught um, a sailfish in the gulf even just with this setup, so it's something to be wary of, but yeah, we're not we're not targeting those fish at all. And I caught a marlin. <laughs> Keep pulling it up. Pull it up. Oh my goodness! No, no, it's not a marlin, it's a sailfish. A sailfish. Oh. It didn't take to the air though, did it? No. Just because we run this, it doesn't mean we don't occasionally get big fish all the same. We've had some honkers on board. And... Yeah, my very first trip with Troy, we was the biggest <laughs> fish I've caught with him on this boat. And um, well, you brought it in. <laughs> it was a 25 kilo, roughly, Spanish yeah. mackerel. It was yeah. huge. It's probably <laughs> the biggest mackerel that I've brought onto Marul. It was lucky that we were going into Broome because yeah. we couldn't have eaten it all ourselves. Oh, I just wanted to add before we get on with the episode, um, there is lots of fishing in it, but it didn't all happen in one day. We were sailing up the Ningaloo coast for a week and this was just us filling our fridge that week. Um, and that was the most exciting stuff, getting, getting more fresh food and bringing in fish. Yeah, so here That's goes the we, show, yeah. sailing and fishing. <laughs> Wind that drag up a little bit more, so it's off strike drag, that's it, and now pump him up. We'll try not to take any um, leeway off our sails. As we've mentioned in the past, we like to keep sailing at speed when we catch a fish. This reduces the likelihood of our fish getting stolen by the sharks that like to keep pelagic fish company and minimises sail handling while we're busy trying to bring the fish on board. Yeah, we've got it. Once the fish is sufficiently tired, we gaff it and stun it with a hard fish bat before bringing it on board. Where possible, we try to remove the lure before bringing the fish into the cockpit as well. A large, powerful fish with a set of hooks as well as teeth in a small cockpit demands respect. Down the side, I need to clear room into there. Watch this lure, all right? Yeah. There's Pasky's tuna. We saw the we saw the fight. She's um, she's got swelling arms now. She looks like Popeye. Those forearms. <laughs> I feel a bit like I've got lactic acid buildup. <laughs> I feel like I had a workout. So that's it. That's just the right size tuna for us. You know, like about an arm's length tuna. So we'll have to um, we'll give it a scrub. So I just got to take the anti foul off this tuna. <laughs> they um, they've got a pretty pretty decent amount of slime on them, and we like to scrub our fish 
you know, before we um, before we take the fillets off them. And the reason being is it makes them easier to handle. You know, they're not slimy, not slippery. And also, when we're making the cuts, we know like we don't put the slime down and um, down into the flesh. A few years ago, we we met a fellow in the Whit Sundays. His channel's um, Sail to Spear. And we were talking about it and he made a lot of sense when you're processing meat <laughs> you don't want to introduce the outside bacteria and stuff like that which that slime's got lots of into your into your into your food because we found before we were scrubbing it sometimes if we'd had the fish for a while they it would get a bit of a flavor to it we put it down to that slime it's either a yellowfin or a big eye tuna uh we just have to id it and we'll get back to you on that a bit later i'm going with a juvenile yellowfin Juvenile yellow fin. Because the length of the pectoral fins. Yep. And there is a bit of a notch here. And, and those belly. those belly stripes are a little bit curved. Yeah. So is the notch was do you remember that the notch at the end in between the two? Do you want to just show us that? So see how he's got a notch in his tail there? Yeah. Right there. And it's built up. Not only that, like his pectoral fin when we hold it down in its little groove. See how the tip just extends a bit past this fin? Oh, is that another feature, is it? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Okay. And, cool. and those belly stripes, yep. which are juvenile, you know, they're not they're not bars, they're, mm. they're curved. Yeah. So if they were if they were bars, I would say that this is a big eye tuna. A juvenile of these, the big eye tuna and the yellow fin is anything under 120 centimetres. <laughs> anything under a metre twenty is is considered juvenile. They don't necessarily have a size limit on tuna in, here in Australia. Like we've, we've got a pretty good population of these things up and down the coast. And they're very aggressive feeders and they do quite well. But this is about the size that we like. Really big tuna would be would be hard for us to store and we wouldn't want to waste any because these fish are amazing. They're really good food. So we're really happy when we get a fish about, about this long, yeah, my arm. That's like... Seven? Eight, nine kilos. Eight, nine kilos. So that, that's a good amount of food for us, you know. Yeah. Like, Once it's processed, it'd be about four kilos a fish. Yeah, well, you don't get a lot of um, you don't get a lot of meat out of the head on these. So it's whoa. <laughs> it's not too bad. It's a little bit hard in these conditions processing fish, but we've got to do it. Ah. Every now and then, you know, like it, everything just combines to make, <laughs> make those larger waves. Whoa, that's pretty good. You're right on the spine. Occasionally, while I'm processing the fish, you'll see me pause and brace. After years of living on a boat, people tend to get a bit of a second sense that a jarring motion or a jolt is on the way by the way the ship is moving. I'd film with the other camera, but I'm feeling a little bit queasy. So. <laughs> yeah, sure. Done your part, you got him on board. Oh, it's so hard because it's warm and floppy. Yeah, this would be a lot easier if this if this fish was, if this fish was cold. Going five knots, <laughs> five and a half knots. <laughs> we've had a few, um, we've had a few tuna challenges, haven't we? <laughs> we just don't have the, we don't have the time up our sleeve to heave two to do it though. So if it was a bit in the tail but usual so we can see then that I cut I cut that fillet fillet that fillet into bits that my knife is as long or longer than and the reason being is tuna you need to have this bloodline out and there's a set of bones through there so I just like to 
I, I haven't really found a better way of doing it for us that gives us nice sized logs for consumption and it's easy to follow and take the skin off just by going down and then yeah. cutting out towards the skin. This one's got a little bit of dressing to do, but not too bad. We can do bad. that when it's cold. Yeah. Ooh. Wow, they're perfect, those long stuff. Not bad, are they? Mm -hmm. So what we found with tuna is it's really important to get it as cold as possible so we don't overload our containers in the fridge. We just do one layer and give a nice air space so they can chill really quickly because that's the key to a good product. We don't have a freezer or ice slurry that we can put our fish in, so we have to do it this way. The only rig that lots of yachts use to fish when underway is some sort of very heavy line with a bungee cord as a shock absorber to make a hand line. I've used this system myself to avoid slowing down while sailing, but having said that, changing to an overhead outfit and monofilament line has vastly improved our strike rate and not lost us many fish. Okay, now some people will be wondering um, what's the outfit that we use and this is not a paid endorsement in any way. Um, we use the Shimano TLD25. Because I've had this for seven years of constant use, <laughs> everything's worn off it. Very simple, so at the moment that's just in, in free, okay? It can spin. There's a little strike alarm, that's what that click, and you can turn that off. What that is is just so if you're sitting around and a fish takes it, you actually hear it. That, that's, it's, that's its only function. It's also, um, the, its other function is for people to use it and just leave it going in it just to annoy everyone around them. So you can just turn that off and, and fish quietly. The drag on this, which is the friction that the fish has to fight against, is controlled by this lever. These aren't buttons, these are just stops, all right? And this button is a button, but the lever hits it. We don't have to do anything and it just puts everything into freeze spool. Now this button up here is to act as a strike stop. So at that point, you know that the drag is set to a given value. And that's for when you're trolling and the fish hits the lure, you want it to be able to pull against that without snapping the line. We like to set that at between 20 and 25%, you know, at one fifth to one quarter of the breaking strain. This breaking strain of this line is 20 kilograms. So I set it for just a little bit under five kilograms because it's getting old. This nylon line is seven years old as well. It's been in the sun for a little while. So far, it's still hanging in there pretty well. Um, and to set that, I like to use, because I'm half Austrian, I like to use an actual little scale. We've got this because we've got a Dyneema rig and I, this is a 300 kilo um, crane scale. So I can, I can use that for a lot of things. And one of them is setting my reel up. So we'll just set the strike drag um, to a quarter to one fifth of the braking strain and you know this 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 will all be ready to rock and roll. Ready? Mm -hmm. Adjust this to touch. So that's our drag set. All right, so that's the strike drag now, and I know that it's a, a set value, and I'll check that every few weeks, and certainly um, about four or five times a year, I'll pull this reel apart and lubricate it, and I overhaul the bearings quite recently. What you can do is, if you're fighting the fish and it's really going for it, if you set that to, you know, like that value I said, you can push that button in and actually increase the drag on the fish all the way up to there, and you won't break it. So that's a nice thing to do. The other, the other thing that I'll just mention quickly before we get on with the rest of the video is these little clips here are to you know, help um, to attach 
a harness for if you're fighting big fish. But we use it by, we have this brass piston clip and we always put a lanyard on our rods, <laughs> okay? Because the, it won't be, um, you know, it won't be the first time that one of these rods, the rod holders that we put it into, quickly spin or something untoward happens and that rod can slip off into the deep. You lose a fishing rod and some poor fish is swimming around with a with an overhead outfit attached to him. So that's it. Measure the drag, make sure you secure your rod and we're, we're pretty much ready to go. We'll just attach a lure to this and we'll see how things go. Back to catching fish. One of the highlights of our trip up the Ningaloo coast was the many humpback whale encounters during their migration north. Here we see a female trying to attract a suitor and since this episode is a fishing episode we'll just mention that in the past we have found pelagic fish in the vicinity of whales. On that contour, eh? Yeah, I was looking how it got really deep on the chart. Mm. No, no, it wasn't that it got deep. We came out of the deep, oh. and there was like a little spur. The 50 meter ground went out like that because we were coming in to see those whales. The dolphin fish must have been hanging off, hanging just off that edge. hanging with us now. It's very exciting because I've never eaten dolphin fish before. So yeah, I've always wondered what it tastes like and now I'll oh know. Let's, get a, colors, let's get a look at it. The, the colour's starting to go. The, the colour's already The blue gone. dots are there. Yeah. All right, as we said before, we use hard-bodied lures, like this thing. This has been pretty popular. There's a couple of puncher wounds in it. Um, at the moment, so this is a bib lure. That bib makes it dive down. Pretty happy with it, pretty robust construction. If we were um, in you know, southern parts of Australia where you didn't have things like mackerel with razor sharp teeth, uh, we could just use nylon, you know, um, nylon fishing line straight to that. But up here we do have to use single strand wire to get around those teeth that I'm talking about. So it doesn't really have to be that long. I like to make it probably yeah, about as long as my arm. Just by forming a loop in it and putting a series of twists, we can secure that and make a nice eye for um, you know, the, the clip on the line to secure to and we'll also put it on this lure. It's really, really straightforward, and I'll just walk you through it. I don't know, what are we going to use now? <laughs> Thumb to finger? Look, just a reasonable amount. Just bend it round and make a nice tight loop in it, and it's going to want to spring apart, so you really you do have to, you do have to hang on to it. Once you get that wire and hold it roughly 90 degrees to itself, you can, you can if it's a bit tough to hold with your fingers, you can get some neat little pliers. Make sure that the two legs are at 90 degrees and give them a twist. Keeping those legs at a 90 degree angle to each other, just keep giving it a few twists, you know, four, five is plenty. If you keep those, if you keep that 90 degree angle fairly consistent, you'll get a really nice looking finished job. And it looks nice because it's very consistent and very strong. On the final twist at this stage, you want to bring that round 
and just by maneuvering your fingers keep that 90 degrees but one of them is now in line with that and one of them is sticking out to the side okay it's just a just a, a little bit of practice it, it's not a difficult thing to achieve once it's like that holding your finger on there and just just spin that round but just keep it at 90 degrees so what you've got now is a series of just twists and if you do another five of these that just go straight around like that that completely locks it so far you have a fairly nice professional looking job of hay wire twists and barrel rolls now some people I've seen, what they'll do now is they'll get their pliers and they'll cut that off right there and you know what it leaves is a razor sharp <laughs> little tag there and as you're bringing it up to get a fish or whatever you invariably put nicks and whatever in your hands. It's not very safe. But if you just bend this into a little crank handle, see how that's done? By getting your pliers now and hanging onto those barrel rolls that you've got you can grab that little handle and just like you were about to crank a car okay imagine there's a car here <laughs> cranking over an engine bend it that way see how neatly that broke off and now there's no sharp edge okay it won't you won't cut you very quickly I'll, at this end I'll, 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 I'll just show you that what happens when you cut it so that one you know I hurried that a bit so it's a bit less professional looking but if you get snips and you snip that off, that's the end result. See that little tag? And trust me, because I've cut that with metal, that is mm. sharp. It's really, really sharp. So you can be fighting a fish or whatever, forget totally about that thing and, and get a, you know, a nice one to two millimetre deep cut <laughs> straight through there. And they fill up with salt and they just make your life a misery when you're cruising. All I have to do to secure that to the lure is of course just bend it through that ring and repeat the process it's exactly the same there's there's nothing to it at all except now that you've got a lure ring that helps you actually hang on to it so that is ready and we'll go and attach that to the to the rod and that'll protect us from getting bitten off lure fishing rod i've used a double here the internet and books are loaded with all sorts of ways to tie these knots and I encourage you to find the one that you like the best but um, yeah all this goes on now is just a clip and I will say ball bearing swivels okay that's what you really want to do um, you're actually rigging you're rigging for fish catching at the moment and it pays to use good gear so ball bearing swivels when you're mucking around these big pelagics they need to be strong but that is essentially what we're looking at bite protection lure a nice snap so we can interchange them at will. A swivel, you know, in case there's any spinning or the fish start to spin. A double line, which gives us, like if, uh, you know, one of these breaks, we've got a backup. It also gives us some elasticity as a shock absorber, which is why I actually like nylon line instead of braid. I actually like the stretch in my trolling gear. And I'll put that there. Put a lanyard on. When we go fishing, we always like to have a lanyard so it can't go overboard. And it would normally go right there and we'd go sailing. <laughs> One thing to mention is that we always have the trolling rod on the windward side of the boat when we're sailing. And that's so we don't end up leaning downhill when fighting a fish. Also, the leeward tendency of a yacht through the water can potentially guide our line into the self-steering gear it's a tuna. One of the drawbacks of trolling is that catch and release of pelagic fish has a low survival rate. That means even if the fish is not a species we are targeting, if we catch it, we eat it. Yeah, we have to eat that one. Okay. That's beautiful. All fish can be well bled by simply cutting the throat latch, but Tuna benefit from also putting a one inch deep cut through the line that marks where their pectoral fin lays against their body. Underneath here, there is a long blood rich region that they use to regulate their body temperature. Ready? Offshore fish ID cards? Yep. 
skipjack tuna. Three to five stripes along the belly. Yep. Three or four? We got four. Basically had the tuna sampling <laughs> trip so far, haven't we? We've had long tail, skipjack, yellowfin. When we were down in southern WA, we had albacore and striped bonito. Yep. Now we've got skipjack. So that's the fishing. Now what we like to do when we're knocked off for the day and we've got enough fish in the fridge, um, if you read the Shimano manual for these reels, what they tell you to do is that strike drag, put that back on and take that all the way so it's in free spool. And that eases up pressure on your, all the springs and everything like that and the, and the drag in there. And that'll leave that free to spin, but that, that little clicker will be just enough resistance so it won't overrun. Um, if you've got really nice bearings and maintained it, it's very easy just to walk by, hit that, and then it'll spool and <laughs> you'll get overruns. The other thing we do, water's really precious on Maroor, we don't have a lot of it. Um, and it's probably pretty good for your reel not to hit it with a hose and force salt and other contaminants inside the reel. There's a lot of recommendations just to use a, you know, a, um, a freshwater spray bottle and just, just hose everything down really well. Give the, this is, this is starting to run out of water, isn't it? Mm -hmm. What we can do is like, just where the spool is and all that, all that line, I usually give that a nice bit of a flush as well, so I don't get salt crystals building up inside, you know, and as the line compresses. We'll let that dry. You can spray a little bit of whatever water dispersant you want, WD-40 or whatever, whatever one you favour. We like to use, um, what's it called? What's our fish lotion called? Basky? Mako oil. <laughs> yeah, we like to spray a bit of mako oil on it from time to time, but we don't want to spoil it too much. And there you go. All ready for another season of hard service. It's looking pretty good for a seven year old beaten up reel. That looks pretty actually. I didn't, oh, not too bad presentation. Good sashimi. Mahi Mahi gets the... The dolphin fish or Mahi Mahi? Yeah. That's really great. Like that's quite firm. No, I thought it'd be a bit mushy because it's fast growing. I don't know why, but <laughs> sort of like soft wood and hard wood. But this is really good. Mm. And that's the skipjack we caught. So we bled that well, so it's not super, super red, but it, obviously it's, it's redder than yellowfin. And I guess that's got a bit more of a minerally flavour than some of the like yellowfin tunas and some of the top grade ones, but we still really like it. And that, that red colour, when we cook it, it'll go white, like chicken. And mm. You can pretty much treat it like chicken, but when it's fresh like that, that is the way to go. This is our, both our first time eating Mahi Mahi raw and we really like it. Um, I'm going to tuck in because it's only good cold. <laughs> what, what's this? That you're just worried. I'll eat it all. And yeah. Look, look at that. And so this is, um, we had some sort of pretty mushy seaweed um, packet. I opened it to make sushi about a week ago, but it didn't, it went stale. And the really good thing to do is to put some oil in a fry pan. I used ghee, leftover ghee from cooking fish yesterday. Put some oil in the fry pan and fry it up. Seaweed crackling. And it's delicious. It's crunchy. Can you hear that? Troy's mm. eating it. It's crunchy. <laughs> thanks everyone um, for sticking with us through the episode. A special thanks going out to everyone. Well, our normal supporters as usual. We always, we always really appreciate it. But everyone that showed such a great response to our t-shirt campaign and got one of our t-shirts. T-shirts, yeah. Um, really, really great. It was an unexpectedly good response, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. So, yeah, we're really pleased that you're enjoying your new shirts. Mm. So yeah. for everyone who's contributed in some way or bought a shirt, you've helped to keep free range sailing independent, not annoying you with adverts yeah. um, and all the rest of it. So just from the bottom of our hearts, thank you for thank supporting Free Range Sailing. Yeah. If you enjoyed the video, hitting the like button helps to get this video suggested to like-minded people. Thanks in advance and see you next time.